Black perspectives haven't always been centered in the telling of America's story. Now, we're taking center stage. Introducing NPR's Black Stories, Black Truths, a collection of Black-led stories from NPR's podcasts. Search NPR Black Stories, Black Truths wherever you get your podcasts. Support comes from Mercedes-Benz of Buckhead, where the power of electric meets the power of Mercedes. Introducing a lineup of electric vehicles, the EQB, the EQS sedan and SUV, the EQE sedan and SUV. The vehicles are all electric. The feeling is all Mercedes. MercedesofBuckhead.com. Welcome back to another edition of Political Breakfast, our, our second one for the week. Again, we're, we're glad that we could do a double dose. Theron and Brian are both here. Lily, our producer, is here as well. And we are so excited uh, to have a special guest with us uh, at this hour. DeKalb CEO Michael Thurman is here, who is also an author, in case you all didn't know. So we're excited to talk about his new book that he's had time to write. When did you have time to write this? Because, you know, DeKalb County keeps you pretty busy. So I want to say officially welcome, and then you could tell us how, how you had time to do all this. Now, first, Lisa, I'm so honored to be all with you this morning. <laughs> and you know I'm your biggest fan. I, and, I'm, I'm president of the Lisa Graham <laughs> Fan Club. Right? <laughs> you know I've appreciated that for 20-some years, so thank you so much. Years. We refused yeah. to call an election. I'm like Putin. I, we refused <laughs> to call an election. <laughs> I want to stay in office. <laughs> well, I appreciate you and your support always, always. So thank you. Some people play golf like my friend Theron. That's his hobby. <laughs> Brian, you know, you a golfer? I don't know. No, you, no. I, no. Well, <laughs> my hobby is researching and writing Georgia history. So wow. that's how yeah. I find time. Uh, it helps to maintain a sense of stability in my life. And I love the uh, solidarity of it, the quietness of it. And it's political leadership enlightened by historical research. The name of the book is called James Oglethorpe, Father of Georgia, A Founder's Journey from Slave Trader to Abolitionist. Start at the beginning. What piqued your interest about James Oglethorpe? I have long been interested in James Oglethorpe. And, you know, as a middle school growing up in Georgia, you all learn the story of James Oglethorpe, who tried to help. Uh, impoverished British subjects by founding a colony here in the New World so that they would have a second chance. Uh, when I was the director of the Department of Family and Children's Services, you covered me back then, uh, <laughs> during the era of welfare reform, we adopted Oglethorpe as our patron saint and used his philosophy, his commitment. The motto of the original trustees was not for self but for others. But I ended up in England with Zell Miller, Mm -hmm. In October 1996, celebrating mm -hmm. the 300th anniversary of his birth, erected near his tomb in a 700-year-old church is a white marble plaque, and written on that plaque, along with many other platitudes and accomplishments, he was a friend of the oppressed Negro. I had no idea. Wow. I was very skeptical of the assertion, and so I set out to determine the truth or lack thereof of that particular statement. Because he was a slave trader, right? And and you just couldn't understand how, how the two went hand in hand, correct? He had served as deputy governor of the Royal African Company, uh, which was chartered by the King of England, who transported over 200,000 enslaved Africans to America <laughs> over a six-year period. And so it seemed very incredulous to me that this man would also be that person Mm -hmm. And that is what commenced my journey. So so talk about change. What what was the catalyst for change that stood out to you? I love the fact that you use the word change because the subtext of this book, which is typically in uh, fiction, but the subtext is a man, James Oglethorpe, who was able to change himself mm -hmm. and consequently was able to change the course of world history. And he received a, a fell into his possession a letter that had been written by an enslaved African that was written in Arabic. He had the letter translated. He was so affected by the contents of the letter because it demonstrated one literacy, which is a trait of civilization, love for family, as well as monotheism, because the writer 
Ayuba Suleiman Diallo was a Muslim. He arranged for his passage from enslavement in the Maryland colony to London, where he became a roaring lion of British society. He ended up having a court, a meeting with the king and queen of England. He became a call celebrity for all of the elite British citizens and ultimately returned to Africa, to Senegal, modern day Senegal, with over 500 pounds of gold and silver. I know Brian and Theron have some questions for you as well. And and Theron, I'll begin with you because this this really piqued your interest. You brought the book to our attention and even wrote about it yourself. Why did you find this so amazing? Well, you know, the the thing that is so interesting about my relationship with the Cab County CEO, Michael Thurman, is that it goes way back over four decades. And uh, before he became an elected official, uh, as he mentioned, I, I just always heard him talk about with his family. And his his daughter, who's the love of his life, Micaiah, just reminded me that his true passion is being a historian and and doing research. And so you're right, Lisa. I you know Brian and I we do both a column in Georgia Trend magazine, and 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 I wanted my column to be for the February issue, which is Black History Month, to talk about this this very important issue. And and I named it "Unlearning Some American History." So that leads me to my question for the CEO. You know, what really inspired you to go deeper? and to finding out more factual information about the the legacy of James Oglethorpe in Georgia. And the second question, two-part question, is sort of what's been the response? I know you've been invited all over the state of Georgia to talk about the book. What has sort of been the response from different people who listen to your overview of the book? Thank you, Theron, for the question. Uh, I was aware that if we were able to expand the humanitarian legacy of James Oglethorpe, that his concern for the plight of poor, unemployed British subjects, also included uh, impoverished, enslaved black people, then we would have to reevaluate what it means to literally be a Georgian. Think about it. The father of Georgia in the early 18th century, when every other colony had legalized slavery here in the North American wilderness, one man, almost like Jeremiah, crying out in the wilderness, said no. So I think it helps or reshapes what it means for us to be Georgians. And not only did he oppose slavery, he allowed Jewish colonists uh, to come and settle in Georgia, despite a prohibition uh, that should have prevented them from doing so. He embraced Native Indians, Native Americans, and treated them as fellow human beings. Uh, He was respectful of women intellectuals in England, Uh, the blue stockings, when all the other male leaders were criticizing them and and, and trying to, quite frankly, destroy their reputations, Oglethorpe stood out to defend them. So what he was, he was a humanist. He saw humanity, regardless of race, color, creed. And the response has been tremendous. I was in Athens last night, the Athens Regional Library, the, the Athens Historical Society hosted an event. It was packed, and of course, I was honored to be there. But people want to embrace a history that brings us together. History has become so toxic, Mm -hmm. and history wars are raging all over this country. Here is a history that all of us currently, contemporary Georgians, can celebrate and be proud of. You know, the the things you just said about him indicate someone who was— full of very progressive ideas for his day. I mean, uh, not necessarily for, for modern times, but back then, I mean, talking about women's rights, I mean, that was not that was not something that was taken very seriously during the, the 1700s. Black people's rights not taken very seriously. Jewish people's rights not taken very seriously. How did someone with those viewpoints that were outside of the norms of his society get into a leadership position where he gets his own colony, A, and then B, why did slaves eventually come to Georgia? What happened that we go from an abolitionist leader to a time when uh, enslaved Africans are, are brought here? Great question. Well, obviously, he was a man ahead of his times. Uh, he was a member of the British Parliament. He served in the House of Commons. He was also chairman of a Christian evangelical organization called the Associates of Dr. Bray who sought to Christianize enslaved blacks and native Indians throughout the British Empire. So he also, and it's very important, 
he was a scholar of Greek, Roman, and ancient African civilization. It's really hard to process how this man could exist in that time period. Tell you the truth, Brian, some of his ideas are progressive even in the 21st century, if you yeah. really think about yeah. it. And he was a politician who, unlike most of us, you know, we see, we comment, we make speeches, but he wanted to change and improve society. In early 18th century England, debt of prisoners were overflowing. Uh, at that point in history, if you could not pay your debts, creditors could have you in prison. And the, a major theme though, of uh, of uh, Charles yeah. Dickens's work uh, a century yes. later. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. It's Charles Dickens, <laughs> yeah. and his best friend was in prison who wrote a book, and he could not pay the printer, and the printer had him in prison, and he died from smallpox while mm. he was incarcerated. Mm. So Oglethorpe served on a committee called the Committee on Jails. He uncovered horrible living conditions and rampant corruption, passed legislation in 1729 that freed 10,000 British debtors, and he became a national hero throughout the British Empire. But in politics, and you know that, Brian, you solve one problem, oftentimes what? You create another one. Yeah. So 10,000 impoverished citizens who had been incarcerated were set free they then became homeless beggars on the streets of London mm -hmm. and other cities. So he had to figure out, all right, what do I do now? The same question we ask when we ride around Atlanta and DeKalb, when we see so many homeless people yeah. sleeping on the bridges and in tents, what can we do to try to mitigate or improve this situation? Well, his solution was to create a colony in North America located between Spanish-controlled Florida and South Carolina to give these impoverished people a second chance and a second opportunity. Support comes from Mercedes-Benz of Buckhead, where you can make your dream car a reality. Mercedes-certified pre-owned vehicles are rigorously inspected to live up to your highest expectations and are backed by a one-year unlimited mile warranty. MercedesofBuckhead.com Sounds Like ATL is a music documentary series that takes an in-depth look at the artists amplifying Atlanta's famed music community. Built around a desire to highlight Atlanta's diverse and world-renowned music scene, each episode features unforgettable, intimate musical performances by fresh new musical guests, each with exclusive interviews about the stories behind their music. Listen at wabe.org or wherever you find your podcasts. Back to the slave trading, how invested was he in the slave industry, so to speak? And what did this, is it Ayuba Suleiman Diallo? What did he say in that letter that was so profound to, to change his, his heart and his, his way of thinking? It's questionable as to why Oglethorpe actually served in that position, uh, because he was also chair of this evangelical organization that was trying to Christianize enslaved blacks in America, in North America and in Africa. So it's questionable. And he was in that position for two years. It's something I couldn't answer. But the facts oftentimes, if you assimilate and associate with people, then that's who you are. Right. The good news is after he read the letter or had the letter translated, he resigned from the Royal African Company, sold all his stock, and severed all ties. What was in the letter was evidence of civilization and humanity. It was the prevailing view in Europe and, uh, and many other civilizations that black people were subhuman, that we were soulless, mm -hmm. and British law defined Africans and black people as property not human beings. For Oglethorpe to challenge that idea at that point in time was revolutionary. But what triggered it was Diallo's literacy and his intelligence. Henry Louis Gates quips that Diallo wrote his way to freedom. Wow. The power of the written word can change uh, not just an individual life, but in this instance, I think it helped change the course of history because it triggered Oglethorpe's journey from slave trader to abolitionist. So, you know, after Oglethorpe, why did slavery take hold in, in Georgia? What, what happened? 
it was the dominant political issue of the day, political, economic issue, moral issue of the day. And there were a group of Georgia colonists, as well as influential people in South Carolina, who wanted slave labor because it was cheap and it was highly productive and it was generating millions and millions of pounds of wealth for those who either traded or owned enslaved black people. So almost from the very beginning, these malcontents, these pro-slavery Georgia colonists recognized that the only way to get to 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 create or to bring legalized slavery to Georgia would be to undermine Oglethorpe's reputation and his authority. So he became the target of an intense political smear campaign. And it persisted for about a decade here in Georgia and in England. And it's the typical, you know, it, negative campaign in politics, right? It's an never. 18th century negative campaign. I've never done it. I've never done it. So yeah, you won't hold up to it, right? <laughs> Don't hold up to it. But it's exactly what happened to Oglethorpe. And even after 10 years, check this out. Finally, they overcame his resistance and his, his courageous fight to prevent the expansion of slavery into Georgia. He left Georgia in disgrace, mm -hmm. facing a charge of treason, facing probably financial ruin because Parliament wouldn't reimburse him for substantial sums he had invested. And of course, if he had been convicted of treason, uh, that's an offense punishable by death. But it was all precipitated by pro-slavery forces to basically get him out of Georgia so that slaves could come in. And on January 1st, 1751, slavery was legalized in Georgia. Wow. CEO Thurman, let's let's bring it to 2024. What do you think James Oglethorpe would have to say about Georgia today? And then second question is, in writing this book and now talking about it, and now you're selling the books and, you know, people are buying it and giving you response. What have you learned about yourself in this in this whole process as well? The challenge that I had to overcome was the challenge of what I thought I knew. Mm. I had to unlearn before I could learn and then relearn. I understood what I knew to be absolutely true about Oglethorpe. That's why I was skepti skeptical because of what I was reading. So in part, the first step in learning is unlearning. The, one of the things I had to kind of recalibrate is the Underground Railroad out of Georgia it's the cornerstone of African-American history. You follow what? The North Star of Freedom. Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Well, the Underground Railroad out of South Carolina and later Georgia ran south, not north. Oh, really? Yes. Typically, the narrative is you escape north to get to what? A slave-free state or Canada. But that was a nation much closer than Canada that offered sanctuary and freedom to freedom-seeking blacks. And the nation was Florida because it was controlled by Spain. And for over 100 years, Spain had offered freedom and sanctuary to any fugitive British and later American enslaved person who would come to Florida, pledge allegiance to the Spanish king, and become a Catholic. But that was a nation, even before you could arrive in Florida, that would offer you sanctuary and freedom. And that was the Seminole nation. The Seminoles in the late, early 1700s and early 1800s were actually in South Georgia and North Florida. Mm -hmm. Okie for Noki is not a Crete word. It's not a Cherokee word. It's a Seminole. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Means land of the trembling earth. There's a county over in Southwest Georgia, right on the Alabama line, right in the corner. It's called what? Not Cherokee, not Crete. It's what? Seminole, Seminole County. Yeah. And the Seminoles were completely assimilated tribe of red and black people. They lived together. Now, Lisa, what your grandmama always told you that you got Native American blood. Your grandmama always told you that. You did. <laughs> <laughs> um, Let, let's say it right. Let's say it right. Your, my grandma always used to say, uh, Michael, as you know, uh, boy, you got a little Indian in you. Yeah. Got a little Indian. <laughs> That's what she would say. You got a little Indian in you. <laughs> <laughs> skin, your skin tone or either your nose right uh, yes, your nose, absolutely. Cheekbones, 
Yeah. But, yeah, but it sure. was true with right. the Seminole, right. not so much with the Creek and the Cherokee, but it was true with Seminole. Right. And there's an entire culture of Negro Seminoles. Right. And the Seminole, primarily the Negro Seminole, fought three major wars, the, the most expensive, deadliest wars America ever fought with Native Indians for the mm -hmm. Seminole Wars. Mm -hmm. And the Seminoles were never defeated on the field of battle. But think of all the cowboy and Indian movies you've seen, how many of them actually focus on Seminole culture? Wow. Wow. Very few. Yeah. I've seen only one. Because, and if you listen, if you read the letters from the Americans, so, and by the way, it was a secret war, similar to us going into Cambodia during the Vietnam era. They fought it as a secret war. It became a state secret. And the last general to go and fight, and, and basically it was a slave catching operation, was Andrew Jackson. Oh, wow. Well, I, I tell you, the reviews are already out, and this is a 27-year journey that certainly is a winning rave reviews. The book is called James Oglethorpe, Father of Georgia, Founder's Journey from Slave Trader to Abolitionist. Uh, CEO Michael Thurman, thank you so much uh, for sharing your wealth of knowledge and you know your, your talents as an author as well. Thank you for joining us. Uh, honored to be here, and Oglethorpe allows us, as Lincoln said, to pursue our better angels mm -hmm. yeah, as absolutely. individuals and as a state. And to celebrate American history. This is all and American, American history. history. Absolutely. And, you know, and that, that's the point. The anti-slavery and abolitionist movement was an interracial movement. It was black and white people mm -hmm. and Native American people mm -hmm. fighting together for truth and justice and fairness. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Mr. CEO, thank you so much for doing this. I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading this. You asked me if I play golf. No, I don't. What I do <laughs> is read. And so I will be consuming this <laughs> book as Theron is, you know, rounding hole nine on his way to. Uh, but as, I, I as, read as and write too. Now. Hold on. I read and write. <laughs> <laughs> Not all I do is play golf. I do read and write. Read and write. <laughs> and I talk. <laughs> That's me. Uh, I, uh, I have known this was coming for some time because I was in a green room with Michael Thurman in 2020 as we were waiting to go on TV together. And he was like, yep. hey, I'm working on this book about James Oglethorpe. So I know it's been in the process for a long time. And you have told me some stuff today that I simply didn't know. Mm -hmm. I take pride in having a lot of knowledge about Georgia's history. I, I love it. But I, I tell you, I'm realizing after hearing this that Oglethorpe is a bit of a blank slate for me. That I've got a lot mm -hmm. to learn. So I'm I'm looking forward to uh, to getting that. So please have your um, your publisher send free yeah. copies to me and Theron. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, I pre-ordered mine. Local bookstores, I said, you can get yeah, it at local I, bookstores I, and I, online. And, and thank you, yeah. thank you it's for the history. It's blowing up on Amazon. It's yeah. blowing up on Amazon. I pre-ordered mine yeah. probably about two months ago. And, yeah, uh, just thank got you, it. thank yeah. you, thank you for the history lesson. We certainly do appreciate no, it. Thank you all. It's been a, an honor and a privilege, and I'm, I'm so proud of the great work. You all are the one that's blowing up. Let's just be clear. <laughs> This podcast is amazing. Oh, we Thank appreciate you so much. Congratulations. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All Thank right. you. From WABE Studios, the podcast where they read stories is a new children's storytelling podcast featuring notable Atlantans and performers reading classic and contemporary children's books. Each episode contains a story meant to entertain, inspire, and inform young listeners. No screens required. The podcast where they read stories features adaptations from both chapter books and picture books. Join us at wabe.org slash stories podcast or wherever you listen to podcasts. W-A-B-E.